Hey everyone, so we were talking with Asus about power design and I said, you know what, let's, let's stop this and record it because a lot of this is over my head. So let's just get it on camera and go through it for viewership as well. And I'm joined by Jonathan from Asus. He's an ROG PM, right? Yep. Work on the ROG products. And we're gonna talk through uh, some transient response, some load line briefly, things like that on VRM design. It's really interesting information, gives you a basic, like a primer on the types of things ASUS has to think about when they're building a VRM. And so I guess we'll just point out here that uh, this is really top level stuff. They're, we're not talking like specific use cases or edge cases or anything like that. We're just primer only. Yeah. So don't, don't go and try to design a, a VRM with this because you'll need a lot more information. But we'll go through the basics today. Should be pretty fun and uh, hopefully we'll have more content like this. Before that, this video is brought to you by us and the Gamers Nexus Toolkit on store.gamersnexus.net. Our brand new toolkit just launched and contains 10 custom made drivers for video card disassembly, repasting and teardowns. The eight core tools are made of high quality chromium vanadium alloy steel that's built for long service life and resistance to wear during use. The other two tools are carbon steel hex heads that were custom ground down for capacitor clearance on video cards. All the tools are easily mounted to a pegboard or stored in the GN made tool bag for easy transport. Learn more at the link in the description below. Okay, so VRM structure. Let's, let's go through this. Uh, v core controller, power stages, CPU over here. And then I see like steps on the bottom, I guess. So this two main parts, right, uh, about a VRM that people are kind of concerned about. Number one, the most obvious is thermal performance, mm -hmm. right? If people want the components to run cooler because it makes it last longer. Yeah, yeah. Um, and well, for thermal, uh, for thermal performance, right, it gets a little bit confusing because um, people, a lot of people think that like adding more phases is better. And this is true um, because when you add you know, a second PWM, uh, fourth PWM signal here. You have to add a fourth power stage. Mm. So now your power load is split between four components instead of three, right? And so when you add more phases, technically it's, it, it's, it's bad, it performs thermally better. But when you're talking about the phase, you're actually talking about the control signal, how you're controlling. Right. So in our solution right now, we're actually kind of using like um, more power stages per PWM control signal mm. running in parallel. And um, that spreads the load while um, you know removing the doubler, which you know introduces some delay. Uh, you had a, uh, an example with these two boards, so you've got, I think these are like the same board, right? Except the VRMs changed. Yeah. So you've got a twin and and then uh, an extended phase design. Yep. So the heat load on these, I mean, what does it look like uh, thermally? Is it is it basically? Do they end up looking the same thermally, or is like, or does twin perform better, or what? Yeah, so both of these, right? Since the the components that are used are exactly the same, uh -huh. um, the power is spread across the same area, and uh, the difference is actually over here. You can see these. You can see these little tiny ICs right yeah, here. Yeah. Those are the doublers, right? So basically, these add a little bit of heat, but that's just like IC efficiency, which right, is right. virtually nothing. Okay. Um, so that's like kind of negligible, but then. Over here is, you know, the 12 volt comes in over here, passes through these components, and then this then goes through, you know, the, the choke and it provides power ultimately to the CPU. Right, and we were also talking about how you've got the caps kind of evenly spaced. You know, your, your power, your 8-pin power connectors can't necessarily always be closest right. to your VRM. Yeah, because you're over of here on this issues, one. So. Right, so when it comes in over here, by the time you get to this part of the power plane, there's a bit of like, uh, there can be like some power drop or okay. like, um, you know, sometimes like the, the power doesn't distribute perfectly evenly across this entire um, distance. Okay. And Got so it. we, these capacitors kind of act as uh, mini batteries to, um, to hold the charge. To hold the charge and then like distribute it when necessary. Right, right. Now these also function as, you know, a ripple of, uh, Ripple filtering, right? Which is necessary if you know if you're using fewer phases, right? Because mm. this is something that um, is a weakness, you know, when you do have less phases. This is electrical. We can get into that in a little bit okay. more detail later. But if you're concerned about thermal performance, right? What you really need to look at is how many power stages you have. And a power stage is basically an IC that comprises of a driver, a high side MOSFET, mm. and a low side MOSFET. And actually, between those three components, the driver itself actually doesn't add any additional heat. Okay. But the fact that the driver is integrated with the high side, low side MOSFET, the impedances, they can all be kind of tuned uh, to be uh, more, uh, more ideal for each other. Right, and right. so it's a more efficient package overall. Okay, 
Well, there's two two things we were talking about mainly. There's Ripple and then there's transient response, right. I guess, right? Okay. These are the two parts that uh, kind of cover um, the electrical performance part of uh, okay. VRM. And we just need to make sure, uh, one, that I understand what you're talking about, and then two, that the viewers understand what you're talking about. So right. we'll go through, I guess, the top level of Ripple and of uh, transient response. So yeah, this is the other half to kind of more phases is better is because when you have more phases, right, they turn on kind of in turns, right? right. And then basically... So six, 16 phases in the bright red? Yeah. Um, and then this is actually like the, the amount of ripple. And you see it's okay. not, it doesn't remain constant across all duty cycles. It changes. Mm. Um, and this is actually like, for example, like the, the equation for input ripple, ripple current. And okay. you can see it depends on the phase number. So current over which is N. phase number. Okay. Yep. And then this is a maximum current. And then this is the duty cycle. Okay. Right. And so you can see over here, like when you, you know, when you have less phases, fewer phases, right? Ripple is worse. And as you get higher though, you kind of see from eight to 16, it kind of starts getting into diminishing returns. Right. Um, and then, right, this is what we were talking about with the capacitors earlier, where you can have input filtering also to kind of reduce like, you know, the input current uh, to kind of not reduce it, but uh, to buffer the input, uh, input current. And, um, you know, in general, right, like one capacitor, ours is rated for five, uh, 5,000 milliamps which is, you know. So we've got a ripple current of uh, 15, uh, under 16 on a four phase. Uh, 15, 15 amps over there on the four phase, yeah, right? Yeah, and then so yeah. then, you know, you won't need as many capacitors as what we put on the board itself, right? Um, which is why, you know, um, sometimes you might see like, oh, okay, like one generation has fewer technical phases than another one. Right. But the capacitors have remained the same is because, you know, the primary reason for why we're using those capacitors is actually not because Ripple is an issue. It's because of the, you know, the, the, in, uh, the input okay. uh, to buffer the 12 volt uh, to keep it stable to the VRM. Got it. Um, so now let's get into kind of like transient okay, response. Sure. Right? And so like what is transient response and like why is it important? And so like I, uh, we were talking earlier, right? Like uh, this, this is very simple, uh, sorry. P equals it goes VI, v I. right? This is just power is voltage times current, current right? right? It's fairly easy to understand. So what happens, like, you know, when you're, when you're providing power over to the CPU, right? As soon as the CPU kind of hits a high load, it starts drawing more current, right? And so you got the current sense over here, uh -huh. right? So the current sense has to come back to the PWM, it has a feedback information to the PWM controller before the PWM controller can start saying, okay, I need to give this, I need to provide more current, right? So if you can imagine, right, if, for example, we're giving maybe like, if we're giving like maybe like 50 watts of power, right, if your current is starting to spike up, you know, it goes up from like, you know, 40 amps to like, you know, 100 amps, right? Yeah. Well, if you talk about like 50 watts of power distributed between these two numbers, right, this is like, this is going to be like 0 0.2 volts. This is going to be, oh, I chose a really bad number. <laughs> um, but, you know, much bigger than, it's going to be. Uh, should, we, should we calculate it? Yeah, we could. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we, we're going to cut ahead a bit so that we can save some time on just plotting the graphs and everything. Um, OK, so, so what are we looking at right now? So right now you have, uh, this is the V core. This is the, um, the current. And uh, it's plotted against time, right? And so okay. we have, kind of, uh, you have like V2 and V1 right here. And, these dotted lines, they represent the grid. Okay. Uh, they represent like, you know, this is at the same point, uh, same voltage and same, right. same time on this, on the scale. On each one. Okay. And so what happens is uh, when, you know, your current kind of spikes up, right? Mm -hmm. In an ideal world, you'd be able to kind of, your voltage would be able to drop and then basically stabilize right away. To level out. It's, yeah, to level okay. out. Kind of match up, the numbers have to align up. Right. Um, and so when you're, when you're reacting over here, it, Comes, you, what actually ends up happening is usually there's a little bit of a dip I see. Okay. because there's a lag time before when the PWM controller can react to the. So I guess ideally in a in a perfect world where you have no constraints, you have basically a kind of square wave. Yep. Where it just it squares out at the edges on each of them, but in reality, uh, your your is this yeah. is an undershoot a different thing? Is that is it correct to use the phrase undershoot for this or no? Uh, or is that a different technical term? Undershoot. Undershoot is <laughs> a term, right? Yeah, technically that's a... Different thing? No, no, that's, that's correct. Okay. <laughs> um, 
but then you're getting into a lot of uh, different. Uh, okay, well let's let's go back to what you were saying then. <laughs> um, so if we if we if we go that for now, um, so, so let me round these off. Okay. Just so that you know. So this is more of the. This is more of reality. Like, you know, what really happens, but you know, at the same time frame, kind of still applies here. Right. So this will this will kind of dip, right? And then basically, what happens? What what's happening over here, right? Is because of you know p equals v i, right? The current's increasing, right? And the video, uh, the film control is still taking time to react. Uh -huh. So the way you tune it is you you start replenishing current at this point, and then what might happen is it might kind of it might kind of increase over you know, your target v one, and then maybe under a little bit, and then and then stabilize. So it takes a little bit to fit to to level out to where it needs to be. Right. And what, what's happening over here is um, this duration, right? You want this to kind of stabilize quickly and you uh -huh. want to make sure this, this first peak is not, it's not too low. Not too extreme? Yeah. Okay. And so what is V1 and V2 you might be kind of like asking is like, why does, why does the voltage even change, right? Well, if, you're, if you remember, right, you have what's called a DC low line, uh -huh. yeah. right? And that is, uh, the low line looks something like this. So basically, you know, as your current is going up, right, this is this this drop to this drop over here. That's your load line taking effect. Okay. And this is why I'm uh, I'm kind of getting a, a load line is because like a lot of people are control uh, concerned about the electrical performance because they want the best overclocking capability, right? And a lot of people think that like a zero load line is usually like the ideal scenario. Um, but what happens when you have a zero load line is you're basically forcing the voltage to try to stay at like V2 all the time. Okay. And so what will happen is, you know, if you don't have a, an appropriately steep load line, right? Mm -hmm. This reaction right here will increase as load line gets flatter. Okay. So if you had like a load line, um, let me, if we're done with this, let me yeah, uh, sure. clear this real quick. So if we, uh, so if we apply this over here, this is, this will basically look like this, right? V1 and then- V1 and V2, okay. This is basically working at I1. This is at I2. And then if you had a shallower load line, or if you had like a really flat load line, right? At basically I one, this will be uh, this will be kind of V one prime uh, asset. Uh, okay, and then V two would probably stay the same. So basically, it'll look like. I see. Okay. Uh, basically, this this will be like much bigger. Okay. And then the settling time would be actually much longer. With a shallower so, load line. Yeah, and okay. so that's like that's why you would need maybe like uh, that's why you need to kind of play around with. Uh, you know, VRMs a lot. Right. Um, I mean, I, I think there is some truth to having a shallow low line because, I mean, in general, if your board is tuned very well, right, for the CPU characteristics, mm -hmm. uh, I think you can get, you can in general get away with a shallow low line where you can, because it can react properly and kind of uh, dampen, you know, some of the voltage stabilized, okay. voltage stabilized current uh, quickly enough, right? But to get like a perfectly flat load line for any, VRM is actually extremely difficult. Um, borderline, I think, um, impossible. Right. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Um, so that's kind of um, a quick primer on transient response with a little bit kind of spilled into load right. line. Right, a little bit of load line, a little bit of ripple. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, part of the, the latter, the later data, mm. right, the importance of that is just that, you know, when you're talking about transient response, like the magnitude of the, the V min, right? That's like at like something like 50 millivolts, uh -huh. right? But then your ripple, the difference between your, the two ripple is like something within five millivolts, right? Right. So it's like a magnitude greater, you know, of an issue than ripple. Even though ripple is something that you see may, maybe constantly, right? But because you know, as we said, like the difference um, in CPU characteristics now because of the P state, uh, C space, yeah, yeah. because of the power saving, the turbo boost, turbo boost, and then just having more cores, right? having that dynamic current swing, right? It, it really changed our priority for, yeah. you know, this current crop of CPUs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you remember- well, we, like, were, we were stuck at four cores for like 
years. I yeah. Don't know, so. And and not just that though. If you think about like just like like something like three years ago, X ninety nine. Yeah. The the king of kings was the ten core you know right. extreme edition processor, right. right? And now we're at eight cores on you know on on mainstream, on mainstream desktop. Yeah. Right. And like we're kind of like baffled. You know. Also, everybody's like, oh. More cores for gaming, you know? Oh, yeah, why can't you do so many cores for game? Well, like, if you want more performance, right? I guess this is what can be done at this yeah. point right now. That seems to be the trend of what's going on. And yeah. so we're just kind of going with the flow. Right, you have to adjust the designs to match it. Yeah, and so, you know, there's merits to everything. You know, everything's, you know, nothing's perfect, right? right. There's trade-offs you're always going to have to make. And well, you know, time and cost, too. Yeah. T time and money is the ultimate decider <laughs> on just about everything. So yeah, yeah, cool. Well, I guess uh, that'll give you uh, a a brief run through of some basics, from VRM basics. So we'll uh, we'll throw to potentially a Buildzoid video in the future with further discussion on all the stuff here today. And thank you for joining me. All right, thank you. We'll see you all next time.